Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Sarah Buino, and I'm delighted to have you join us today. The NARM Training Institute is offering a level two NARM therapist training online so that you can attend from anywhere. The trauma field is evolving so quickly. Trauma-informed therapists who want to learn how to address the long-term impacts of adverse childhood experiences and complex post-traumatic stress disorder want to be trained in NARM. This online NARM therapist training is starting in July 2021. So if you're interested, we'd encourage you to register now to reserve your spot. For more information and to register, please visit www.narmtraining.com slash level two online. We look forward to you joining our growing international NARM community and are inspired to work with you to bring NARM to your clients and communities in order to transform trauma. I'm happy to introduce to you today's guest, Marjorie Floristall. Marjorie has been a lawyer and law professor for over 25 years. She began her career as an international trade and development lawyer for the Clinton administration before heading up a multi-million dollar project of technical assistance training for sub-Saharan Africa. Marjorie later became a full-time tenured professor at McGeorge Law School in Sacramento, where she began to recognize the role of trauma in legal education. This spark of the unexpected led her to the master's program in Jungian psychology at Sonoma State University, and she's completing a Ph.D. in human development at Fielding Graduate University. Marjorie continues to teach law part-time at the University of California, Davis. When not occupied with issues of trauma and healing, she writes legal thrillers and is a pet to four unruly dogs. So please enjoy my conversation with Marjorie Floristall. Marjorie, welcome to Transforming Trauma. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's lovely to meet you. And I'm really excited to hear where our conversation goes today. (laughs) I love it. The unexplored country. (laughs) Yes, yes. Well, the first thing that we like to do on the podcast is ask essentially the, the norm question. What do you want listeners to get out of our time together today? Ooh, I love the norm question. I guess probably what I bring to the offering is that I am using NARM in a non-traditional context. So I'm a law professor and I am using the principles of NARM to really guide my students in the classroom. Uh, This may be a surprise to some of your listeners, but lawyers are not very good with the emotions. (laughs) It's a big big secret. If you didn't know, they're not. (laughs) But slowly that's changing and we're adopting Mm. trauma-informed legal practices. And that's what I'm using NARM to do. And so that's what I'd like to get across in this conversation. The many ways in which NARM is perhaps leaving the therapist's room and it's going more broadly into the world. Oh, that's really exciting. Well, tell us a little bit more detail about where you're working, where you're teaching and who you are. Yeah, sure. So my name is Marjorie Floristal, and I always like to introduce myself by saying I am a storyteller. Mm. I call myself a genre-bending storyteller because I use stories in non-traditional ways. And so I use them in my law school classroom. I'm a fiction writer, so I write- Oh, wow. Yes, I write thrillers of all things. Oh, wow. That's actually a really great crossover, isn't it? <laughs> Law and thrillers? Because my thrillers are about traumatic experiences, like Mm. the 1990s Haitian refugee crisis. My family's from Haiti. I also write about sexual violence against women in the time of Columbus. Um, And so Mm. you can imagine I package all of that sort of deep traumatic work in the context of thrillers and legal thrillers, because I want to draw people's attention to these often underexplored territories. But I want to do it in such a way that you're not gutted from reading one of my books, right? Because the protagonist always wins. The bad guy always gets what's coming to him and to her and all of that. And then finally, I also use stories as healing mechanisms. I have a Master's in Indian psychology. In fact, that's where I met Brad. He taught in the program at Sonoma State where I completed my master's. And I'm doing a PhD in human development at Fielding Graduate University. 
And when I'm not doing all of those things, I, I am a law professor. I teach part-time at UC Davis. And prior to that, I was tenured faculty at Pacific New George in Sacramento. Wow. Yeah. Doing all the things. This is incredible. We have so much we can talk about. I wonder if we could start with what was your interest in trauma? What drew you to the field in general? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question, right? About what guides us. I'm sure yeah. underneath all of it was, of course, focusing in on my own trauma, right? And again, remember, I went into the field of law for a reason, and I became a business lawyer. I was an international trade lawyer because I wanted to get as far away from the emotions as I could possibly get. And then I ran smack dab against it. And I recognized that, you know, wherever you go, there you are, right? And so I thought, well, I'm going to practice international trade law at the country level, right? So I actually mm. had a career in the Clinton White House negotiating trade agreements. And I thought, well, that'll be safe. It's not like criminal law. I will never have to deal with the emotions. Well, guess what? When I go into the negotiating room, I'm dealing with the emotions. I'm dealing with human beings. Trauma showed up. It followed me anyway. Wow. I'm going to be really smart about it. I'm going to become an academic because my <laughs> no emotion there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I did, right? And probably the first or second semester of teaching, I'll never forget, a student came into my office and was in tears and just emoting all over the place. And I, of course, was like, what's with all of this emotion? And I said to the student, let's talk about contract law, because that's what I could bring to that occasion in that moment. But you know what? After the student left, I thought, oh, something has to change within me, right? That, that mm. did not feel good. I did not feel as if I had connected to that student at a human level. Mm -hmm. And I felt the damage that I had done because of my incapacity to hold some of the emotion that was coming from the student. And so as luck would have it, I was diving in towards my midlife crisis and my own stuff was coming up. And I started doing the thing that we do at midlife, which is, you know, attend a seminar here or a retreat there, find this mindfulness, do this meditation practice, et cetera, et cetera, until it snowballed. And I was attending a, a retreat on holotropic breath work. And oh. yeah, exactly, exactly. Because that's where I confronted Jung's work, right? The retreat was about breath work and also Jung's red book. And the night before the conference opened, I had this image of a snake. And the next morning I go down to the meeting room and the red book is open and there was the snake that was in the building. The exact one? The snake. And I had not seen the red book. So would you tell folks if they don't know what the red book is, would you tell them a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. The red book is this sort of phenomenal experience is the only thing that I could call it, right? So Jung, over the course of his practice, and particularly after he had that split from Freud, kind of retreated from the world and basically spent time, he called it the confrontation with the unconscious, right? Working with the symbols of his internal psyche. And the symbols spoke to him and they spoke through him through art and mythology and storytelling. And he kept a journal and hid that journal away for 50 years. But that journal formed the foundation of his modern Jungian psychology. And it wasn't published until, I don't know, was it like 2014 or maybe a little bit earlier, 2010, something like that. They waited a long time because Jung and his supporters were concerned that he might be seen as crazy, if you could imagine that. Oh, at the time, absolutely. Yes. And so that was the book that I encountered as I was having my own confrontation with the unconscious. And it was just what I needed. And so that sent me on a whole different path from law and um, international trade and the inability to feel into my own emotions. Wow. And so, so you were first practicing law. And then after this experience, is that when you got your graduate degree in Jungian psychology? That's right. So I spent mm -hmm. a decade practicing law. And then I 
went into teaching and I taught full-time tenured for another decade, but I met Jung's work during that time. It was maybe my fifth year as a professor. And yeah, I thought, I got to learn more of this. And so what ended up happening by happenstance, I started teaching part-time and kind of turned my focus to psychology. And so I was able to complete the program in Jungian psychology. And because I will always be an academic, I just thought, well, if I'm going to explore myself, I might as well get a degree while I'm doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Two birds, one stone. That's right. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so exciting. And now I'd love to hear, well, you met Brad. And then how did you decide that you were going to go ahead and and jump into the NARM training? Yeah. Brad taught a semantics class in our program at Sonoma State. And it was one of those life-altering classes. And so Brad could call me up tomorrow and say, hey, I'm teaching a Frisbee throwing class. And I would say, (laughs) Sign me up. It's awesome. it's the best, most life altering frisbee throwing class I will ever take. Yeah. So that's number one, right? Yeah. But number two, when Brad reached out and said that he was opening this up to folks who aren't licensed therapists but have advanced uh, psychology degrees, I thought, this is perfect because I was looking to figure out how to bring all that I was learning about trauma into my law school classroom. Again, this will shock your listeners, but there's a lot of trauma in the law school classroom, okay? Mm -hmm. The rates of depression among law students are astronomical. So just one figure for you, right? What we know is that when students enter that first year of law school, the rate of depression is around 8%. It's typical of the U.S. population. By the end of their first year, it's up to 34%. By the time they graduate, 40% of our students are clinically depressed. And then it just snowballs from there into the profession. What do you attribute that to? Is it is it the system? What is Sarah, you've opened a huge question because I'm actually writing my doctoral dissertation on this. Bring it, bring it. Because what is happening here? And there are a lot of, as you can imagine, theories about why that's happening, including the ways in which we teach. So, for example, law school uses the Socratic method, which is a question and answer process, right? That is very public and can be very sort of challenging for students. Others say it's because law school draws neurotic people, right? Like you've probably met a couple of lawyers who are just slightly. My dad was a lawyer. So there's my trauma history for you. (laughs) (laughs) So you know, from personal experience. Uh Well, there's a lot of those going on. But as I've been exploring this and talking to law students, I recognize that there's something more. There is some aspect of trauma going on. And there's also some aspect of a kind of a developmental stage going on, right? And in some ways, it's the confrontation of those two things. Most law students are at that particular age, about 24, 25, right? It's the moment. And so it's that moment meeting that opportunity of a very highly stressful, highly competitive, highly charged environment that creates the combustion. And because we don't do much in the way of training students on self-regulation, on recognizing what's going on below the surface, and in fact, we teach them the opposite, that the emotions have no place in the law, right? We get this. We get levels of anxiety and depression that are just unsustainable. And so law schools now are having a reckoning with that reality. And some of us are seeking to kind of incorporate more into the curriculum. So I'm actually excited because next year, my boss approved for me to teach a course called Trauma-Informed Lawyering. Wow. Yeah, very few law schools in the nation even have such a course. So I am creating a brand new curriculum, you know, to squarely bring emotions into the law school classroom and to deal with them right there. 
Would you give us a peek into what that's like? What's what's on that syllabus? I would love to just pour through that syllabus. <laughs> yeah, well, and the, the syllabus keeps growing. So part of it is to sort of narrow it down or shrink it down, right? But it's really in three parts. Part one, is training the student in recognizing how trauma shows up in themselves, right? We're going to stop pretending that lawyers are emotionless animals. We're not computers, right? And so we have experiences prior to law school, during law school, after law school, that's going to impact us, right? So that's one. Part two is about training our students in vicarious trauma. So in the law school classroom, we use what's called the case method. So we read appellate court cases with sometimes very graphic facts about what's going on. So it could be sexual violence. It could be racial trauma. It could be criminal acts against lesbians, transgendered, et cetera, et cetera. The law school environment raises all sorts of stories that are deeply, deeply wounding and traumatic. And we're still debating about whether we should have such basic things like trigger warnings for our students. And my argument is the trigger warning is the basic, the least that you could be doing, that we actually need to be doing a lot more than that. And part of what we need to be doing is teaching our students to understand how trauma and vicarious trauma works so that the trigger warning doesn't help you to be able to process these facts in a way that's adaptive rather than maladaptive. You need more tools for that. So in the second part of the class, we're going to be exploring things like vicarious trauma, how we identify it, what are the self-regulatory mechanisms that we can be using to kind of help us as we're processing and integrating this. And then the third part of the course will focus on systems, right? And so we're looking at the way in which courts need to become more trauma-informed, for example, because, wow, when people seek to access the courts for justice, good luck with that, right? Because what's the experience of a a rape victim in a courtroom? More trauma. And so we're going to explore the ways in which the systems themselves perpetuate a certain form of violence that is, in fact, deeply harmful and deeply traumatic. And we're going to seek to explore what are the ways in which we can navigate the system in a more trauma-informed way so that at the end of it, our students who by this time will be practicing lawyers and judges and people who are making policy decisions, right, will kind of understand how all three of those parts coalesce into creating the kind of system dynamics that we have in the world, which makes people cringe when you say, hi, I'm a lawyer, right? Wow. And is this course going to be required? for all the law students, I hope. (laughs) Oh, I wish. I wish. From your lips to God's ears, as they say, right? No, at this point, it is very much going to be an elective. But I think that there is a certain group of students. And in fact, this generation, what I noticed with Gen Z is that they are hungering for this. They're no longer willing to accept the idea that they must just grow a tougher skin. And they're demanding more of law schools. So my guess is that the class will be well subscribed. Yeah. And I was I was listening to a webinar from the Kennedy Forum the other day, and I didn't even consider this, but they were saying that millennials as a generation have just consistently gone through trauma, starting with 9-11 and then the recession that happened. And, and since then, and aren't they the first generation to not essentially make as much money as their parents, right? And so if we've got millennials and Gen Z and the generations coming up, they know trauma. Yeah. I mean, you raise such a critical point, right? Because there you're really talking about collective trauma, which is so hard for us to even articulate, let alone deal with. So imagine, for example, teaching in this moment, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a sort of global meltdown, but not having tools and techniques for doing this, right? Or only kind of reflecting on trauma as a personal one-on-one experience, 
So that sometimes, for example, I'll say to my students, well, we're, you're experiencing a, a traumatic event right now. And they'll say, well, not really. Nothing happened in my family. Everyone's fine. Nobody got COVID. And I say to them, it doesn't matter if everyone in your family is in perfect health. We, as the collective, are experiencing real trauma, not to mention the last four years of a horror show of a presidency that really uncovered the deep wounding that makes up this country. And that is the sort of race wound. And so as a Black woman who's had to stand there in the middle of the classroom in the midst of this sort of ongoing onslaught of trauma, right? I've had to sort of come up with mechanisms for both dealing with personal trauma, but also collective trauma. And that is part of my work and why it's so important to me to bring these tools into the law school classroom. Absolutely. And, and you know, we talk a lot in NARM about the more we can have the trauma-informed movement go into different <laughs> different areas, not just mental health, that's where the change is going to happen. Because we've been saying this stuff all along as therapists, of course, but I couldn't even imagine having an interaction with a lawyer where they were utilizing trauma-informed tools. I just, I can't, it, this is just brilliant. And I, I'm really hopeful that this is something that can spread because I'm sure this is going to be so, so very popular. Yeah, I'm glad to say that, in fact, the whole trauma-informed lawyering movement has already taken off. In fact, just a few weeks ago, some friends and I um, sent off a book to the publishers, to the American Bar Association, yay, called Trauma-Informed Legal Practice, and that should be out early next year. So there's a hungering for it in the profession, primarily because we recognize that we need better tools to deal with our clients, right? Our clients are deeply traumatized. But what I'm also kind of sneaking into the discussion is we as lawyers are deeply traumatized and we need all of that in order to function well because we can't sustain the profession with these levels of anxiety and depression and addiction. It's simply not sustainable anymore. Is that why you think that this is popular? Because people are actually starting to open their eyes? I mean, the statistics, I, I feel like I've always heard that lawyers and dentists were the highest risk of suicide and addiction, right? Yes. Why are people paying attention just now? It's fascinating that you say that because the truth is we've been paying attention for a long time. So in my research, for example, the earliest study I found exploring depression among law students was in the 1950s. So you can imagine, we've had this data and these figures for a very long time, right? But the challenge is, what do you do with that? And so for a long time, we've been tinkering at the edges, right? We'll, we might say something like, well, maybe it's the classes that we teach. So let's give students more electives in the first year, or maybe let's cut down this section or that section. Let's overhaul the curriculum. But I think what's happening is as we as a society become more sophisticated about understanding how trauma works, as the neuroscience community has given us more of that sort of hard science about what's happening psychobiologically, and as therapists and psychologists have done the deep work of working with clients in the therapy room, these same folks are no longer accepting things that, you know, what is that phrase? Like, I am no longer accepting the things that I cannot change. I am changing the things that I cannot accept. That's where we are in this moment. Wow. And it's interesting to me, too. I always think about, you know, how do we change professions and really where we train them is the place to make those changes. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah, well, the wonderful thing about law school, right, is if you think about the legal system, the only thing all lawyers or almost all lawyers have in common is that we all had to go through law school. So if you change the law school environment, you change the profession. And that's a pretty amazing. So if you think about systems theory and you think about, OK, where are the various stages at which you can change the system? Wow, law school is front and center. It is the epicenter of all of it. If we can change the law school experience, we can change the profession profoundly. Wow, that's really incredible. And 
I'm curious specifically around NARM, what was it that you learned specifically from the NARM training that you've integrated in, into your classroom? Oh, wow. So much. And what I'm excited about is that next year when I teach my trauma-informed class, I can talk about NARM much more openly, right? But this past year after doing the NARM training, what I've done was incorporate NARM as the kind of subtext. So one example, I teach a class in negotiations. And again, this is where students think, oh, the emotions don't come up. Um, The task is for me to just get my negotiating position and then just ram it through on the other side and, you know, win, right? Like, because this is a win-lose kind of situation. And then the negotiation implodes. But that's when things are at their juiciest, right? And so one of the sort of game changers for me after my NARM training is being trained to look for the psychobiological shifts that are happening, right? And so NARM teaches me to be able to look at facial and body language and breathing patterns to be able to start to assess what's going on there, right? And to slow things down. So in the past, for example, I might have jumped in with my students and we would have focused on the context of the negotiation. Like, what is your position? Yes, let's talk about money, risk control, standards, the end game, right? All of the things that we teach them. But now, right, I'm like, oh, this is a juicy moment. Let's slow this down. And you know what tends to show up? I don't trust this other person. I don't trust them. And it's funny how this shows up in a simulation. In other words, this is just a pretend exercise, but the students are who they are. Their life experiences are what they are. And so it's showing up in this pretend exercise and I can slow it down and I can say, huh, so this is an issue of trust. And just like we might do in NARM, I kind of work with that issue of trust. I ask questions questions, right? I allow the students there, well, I allow, this is such a not a norm thing, but like I sort of at least create the space for them to exercise their own agency, right? To sort of figure out what is going on in the moment and how they might allow that to guide them. And so every time there's one of those kind of emotional explosions, my students think, oh my gosh, I've done something wrong. And Mm. I'm cheering, right? Like this is the great moment. Let's pause. Let's stop. Let's amplify. Let's use some of these tools. And then it becomes an opportunity for them to actually be able to go inward for a moment and then to come back out and do the work. Whereas before NARM, the only tools I had for them was, yeah, this might be a really difficult and challenging thing. You should, you know, focus on what's important and forget about the rest. That's not helpful or meaningful in the moment. But NARM kind of helps me guide the process in a way that can be useful and meaningful and not harmful. Or if it is harmful, it feels like the students have mechanisms, right, for moving through the process instead of just letting them go off with the terrible feelings in their stomach that they might not even be conscious and aware of. Well, I'd love to talk more about this idea of winning and power and thread this through what you were just saying, because I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the philosophical differences between (laughs) the law profession and the therapy profession are vast. And you said it, you were like, it's all about winning. Mm -hmm. And I was in a, a very, like, very benign legal negotiation recently. And I was like, why is the lawyer so mean? And and that's, that was my thought. And I recognize it's all about winning. And if we don't shift the systems of power or what we believe power to be, we will just continue to traumatize each other, right? I'm just, I'm so curious how you see this trauma-informed movement shifting the way that lawyers relate to each other, relate to themselves, relate to clients, like you said, like in the court relating to the people in front of them. Oh, that is such an important question. So got a lot of things come up for me when you say that. So I'm a lawyer married to a therapist, right? So you can just kind of imagine when my wife and I are having our quote unquote discussions, right? 
wait, why are you so focused on this, right? And of course, when do I become at my most lawyerly, but in an argument with my spouse, right? Because I'm focused on logic and winning. And it makes sense to me. And focusing on feelings is not what I'm into in that moment. And so I notice it in my own experience, which is to say, I don't come by this naturally. And by this, I mean, I have been so trained that in an argument, the goal is to win, that it shows up in my private relationships, even when I'm not being a lawyer. And that's a part of the reality that I probably will never fully unpack. I'm going to be a lawyer to my grave. But that doesn't mean that I can't learn tools and resources for navigating. So one example that I use with my students, for example, in the negotiating context, because law school trains you primarily to be a litigator. And a litigator's mindset is there's one winner and there's one loser. And that's the truth. When you go into the courtroom, the judge doesn't say, let's split the baby. The judge says the baby goes to you and you get nothing but a huge legal bill. It's win-lose. Part of why I teach negotiations is I initially I was a litigator, but I didn't like who I became as a litigator. And so I needed to shift my mindset. But I tell my students all of the time, I'm not a natural negotiator. I'm much more of a natural litigator. And so I have had to learn to adopt a negotiation mindset. And a negotiation mindset is much more win-win. So the context there is, how can I help construct an outcome where both of us get what we need from this relationship? And so that's the shift in orientation. And I spend significant time in the sort of early part of my class on negotiations talking to students about things like mindset. What's the difference between how litigators approach problems and how negotiators approach problems? Because they already can't see it. Second or third year of law school, they already can't see it. They feel like the way that they think is natural, whereas the way that they think is win-lose. You know, that's not natural. So that's a huge part of the process that needs to shift and to happen. Now, I don't know that that can shift and change in litigation. Litigation is what it is. At the end of the day, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And so I say to them, look, if you want to go into that system, that's fine. But know that you could be on the losing side and then you have nothing. So if you want to spend time in an alternate reality where there's at least the possibility of constructing a more win-win outcome, here's how you have to shift your mindset. And that's when we talk about these tools and approaches and what it means, right, to not be focusing on who's winning and who's losing. Well, and I'm thinking about an illegal situation where there's addiction involved or there's trauma involved, which impacts the way that people show up. The outcome doesn't need to be different, but the process can be different. Mm -hmm. Right. You talked about a sexual assault survivor being in a courtroom experience. What would it be like for them if the legal system actually recognized their trauma and, and honored that experience? Yeah. And again, there, I'm happy to announce that we're starting to have much more innovative processes, for example, in huge part to reflect the way that the experience is traumatic to the victim and also the way that it is traumatic to a legal personnel. So for example, imagine what a judge must see in some of these horrific cases, the horrible pictures, the testimony. Think about the court reporter, what that person has to deal with. And the question is, is that necessary? Do we need to graphically expose people over and over again to the minute details. So I graduated law school in 1995, and then I clerked for a federal judge. And I can still remember a death penalty case that I worked on. And I remember it because there was a graphic image of the little girl who had been murdered in the file. And I had to go through all of those. And so here we are in 2021, and it is as fresh to me as it was then. 
was that necessary in that moment? It really wasn't. Right. Because that wasn't what the court case was about. The court case was about lots of legal technical issues, but there were those pictures. And so we're starting to ask questions, for example, within the system about, look, are there ways in which we can kind of incorporate some of this evidence without spreading it through the system and just traumatizing everybody in its path? Is mm -hmm. it necessary? And we're coming up with different answers. So for example, we have mental health courts, we have addiction courts that are a very different framework that are meant to be much more about what we call therapeutic jurisprudence, right? Can you explain more about what that is? Yeah, therapeutic jurisprudence is an approach to law that seeks to use uh, law as a healing modality rather than just go to jail. Yes, it exists, right? Like, yeah, my face right now. What? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and I sometimes I'll tell my students this too, and they're in the legal environment, but have not been exposed to those. So therapeutic jurisprudence is where some of these innovations are coming out, like having mental health courts or an addiction courts, um, so that the judges are empowered to come up with solutions that are not about punishment, but are about rehabilitation. They're about offering assistance for addiction rather than just the only thing available to me is to deem you a criminal and to throw you in jail. And so there are all of these things happening. And what we need is a more robust movement to push them to the forefront. So as the folks or the activists who are arguing for sort of abolition of prisons are pushing that work forward, we have different models coming up behind them to say, here are the alternatives that we can construct. They exist. We don't have to reinvent the possibility of justice, right, um, being informed by mercy. I mean, Shakespeare had that in The Merchant of Venice. You know, Portia has this famous quote about the quality of justice has to be tempered by mercy. Otherwise, it's not justice at all. And so we know what to do. We just have to create whole new systems because the ones we've constructed do not work. Right. Well, and thinking about systemic change, I'm also thinking of the overrepresentation of people of color in the legal system and in prisons. And so I'm curious if you've heard of any initiatives that are addressing that directly. That is trauma. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> through words have never been spoken. Okay. Mm -hmm. Through words. Yeah, there is a lot going on in that community. And I say that with something of a chuckle, because the one thing I knew when I stepped into the law school classroom as a student back in the 90s was I will never work in the criminal justice system because I don't see much justice there. And again, as a Black woman, I simply could not fathom being part of a system that wholesale channels people of color into cages, right? So Michelle Alexander writes about the new Jim Crow, and she talks about the prison system as essentially being another form of Jim Crowism, right? And there's no getting around that. We can lie to ourselves and say, well, there's something inherent in blackness or brownness that makes us more prone to violence. We know that that's not true. What we know is that there's something about this system of white supremacy that is prone to stopping a black man for having an air freshener hanging off of his rearview mirror and killing him as a result. There's something about white supremacy that says, if you're being called on a fraud claim for a $20 bill, you should step on the neck of the black man and kill him. But when a mass shooter slaughters women and children, you should practice restraint so that that mass shooter is not killed. And in fact, you can take that mass shooter to Burger King and get him a meal because he is, quote, unproblematic. So there are a lot of examples that we can go through over and over again in which the system has been so traumatizing. In fact, two days ago, part of the other task that I had um, for this week is I held an hour-long session at the law school 
looking at racial trauma and the healing potential of myths and stories. I started out by telling you, right, that that is part of my work in the world. And so what I did there was to use storytelling. And by that, I mean German folk tales and Guatemalan folk tales to explore since time out of mind, how we as a people, and by that, I mean all people, have dealt with pain, trauma, difficulty, and come out on the other side. And that's what fairy tales are about, right? And so I shared those stories as a way of thinking about and constructing a map out of the dark woods. And so there is work being done in the abolition of prisons, for example, in abolishing the police, And no matter how difficult some people might find those terms, what we know is that the system as we've constructed it is working if what we want is a world of absolute chaos, right? Yeah. I'm clapping over here. I'm muted, but I'm clapping everything you're saying. Yes. Yes. But if we want another kind of system, then we have to create different structures for it. Pure and simple. Wow. Oh, your students are so lucky. Oh, thank you. We're heading into exam week, so I don't know if they feel so lucky (laughs) right now. (laughs) Not today. Not today, but hopefully at some point. Yeah. And I I just love, I love hearing this from somebody who is a part of the legal system. Just, you just laid it out so clearly. Thank you. Mm -hmm, My pleasure. Mm. Well, since you are a storyteller too, I wonder if we can sort of shift this to, are there any inspiring stories based on, you know, the the work that you've been doing, how you've been bringing the trauma-informed movement to the legal system? Ooh, mm. <laughs> I love that, right? I love that question because I want to share a, um, a story with you and I'll I'll use the brief version because I know our time is short, but I want to share this story that has really been in my psyche in the last few days. And I, I shared it in the group work that I did. And it's called The Stolen Mother Moon. And like all such stories, it's existed since time and memoriam. But this version I got from Clarissa Pinkola Estes, the Jungian analyst. And I love her work and I'm grateful for that lineage. But the story goes something like this. So there was this village and it was a beautiful village and everything happened just the way it was supposed to happen. All of the mothers and the fathers and non-binary folks and the gender non-conforming folks and the aunties and the uncles, everybody loved each other. And all of the children were just the light in the villagers' eyes, except as there always must be in the psyche and in fairy tales, There was this one thing that was very, very adverse. And that was that this beautiful, harmonious village was surrounded by a moat of black, murky bogs. And it was dark there always, and it stank because everything was rotting. And so it was for that reason, for the darkness of the quagmires and the quicksand, that the people depended on the light of the moon to guide them at night. Some nights, she did not come. And on those nights, the bogs were filled with treachery because there were evil things that lived there. Things that live in the darkest corners of humans' minds would come out at night and lead the poor struggling travelers with no light into the quagmires and drown them. Well, there came a time when a lot of people died over a short period of time. And when the moon mother heard of this, she was filled with sorrow for she cared for humans. So she decided that she would come to earth and she would see for herself. So when the dark of the month came, she stepped onto a slow shooting star and landed at the edge of the marshes. It was so cold there and there were little tufts of willow sticking up here and there and the smell of muck everywhere. And so she pulled her cloak close And there was a little lip of light that shone all around over her beautiful white feet. And she stepped out and she started to get the lay of the land with the quagmires on the left and the bogs on the right. And just when she thought that she had figured everything out, she felt herself topple over. 
she was under the control of one of those twining trees, right? The ones under the control of the evil ones. It sent out tendrils around her wrists and her ankles, holding her as though with manacles. And the more she struggled, the tighter it held her. So there she was in the blackest dark, shivering and straining. And she heard a voice call out from far away, help me, oh, please help. And the moon mother felt such sorrow because that little lip of light that was showing, um, the poor traveler thought that that was a light that was guiding him. So he was drawing ever closer, but there was a big quagmire right in front. And so the moon mother struggled, right, to warn him and her hood fell down and her dazzling hair lit the waters. And oh, how relieved the traveler was to feel the evil ones go back into their watery holes. But he made off with such haste and relief that he forgot to wonder about the wondrous thing that had just occurred. And the mother moon sank exhausted into the mud. And as she did, her head fell onto her breast and her hood fell over her hair and all became darkness again. And the vile things that loved the dark came to them with a kind of whisper chatter. We'll get her now, we'll kill her. Yes, we'll kill her, they said. They gathered around the moon mother, snarling and kicking and grasping. And they drove her into the mud. They who hated humans. At last, no more light shone across those dark waters. And the one who gave light? And even more, the one who shone down on mothers nursing their babies, the one who made sleeping women kiss their lovers' backs, the one who put words into the dreams of poets, that one was pushed deep into the mud. For the evil ones didn't care about mothers or babies. They didn't care about lovers or poets. And the moon mother let one last ray of light zigzag over the waters before she disappeared completely. And the evil ones rolled a great boulder over her grave and danced a crazy dance on top of it. So now, at night, there was no light to guide. So many people became lost. So many children became orphaned. So many people suffered. That the villagers decided they must go and find what had happened to the moon mother. So armed with their torches, they set out into the wet and slimy bog and the grasses were snapping at them and the evil ones were snarling and snapping. But the light from their torches kept them safe until they came to this place where there was a great big boulder and they said they had never seen this boulder in this place before. And there was a little lip of light that shone all around it, whiter than white. So together they pushed and they tugged and they moved the boulder aside. And there out came the moon mother and she lit them up first from behind then from the side and then from above as she climbed the dark staircase up to the sky. So now on most nights, she travels across the sky with her hood turned down and her light radiant everywhere. And on those few now predictable nights, when she veils herself in gray and does not shine, travelers have learned to stay by the hearth and wait until she shows the way again. And this story is finished. Tim Tim Wasesh. Would you please read me a bedtime story every <laughs> night? <laughs> it would be my great honor. <laughs> that was gorgeous. Thank you. Thank that you. was so gorgeous. Thank you so much. It is a story for the ages, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wow. And what is your interpretation of that story and, and how that connects to our conversation today? What a Jungian question you've asked me, right? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> because the whole process is to play with these symbols and to amplify them. And I have used that story in terms of my own personal wounding. Like my mother died when I was nine. And when I first heard that story, for me, it was a deeply personal story of the stolen mother. And these days, as I've worked with it and processed all of that trauma, these days I'm using it to process our collective trauma. 
And so when I look at the stolen moon mother now, I amplify that symbol as the stolen mothers from Africa who have been abused and sexually violated and have been chained and manacled and all of those things, and yet have persevered to arrive at this time where we've come from uh, slavery, we've established our families, we've demanded justice, right? We've worked on constructing these systems that should be more fair and more equitable so that we can imagine a time when we might be flying across the sky with our hoods turned down and free, right? To shine our light everywhere. And that there will always be a moment where darkness comes and more work has to be done in those dark times, right? Uh, That's what winter is about. That's what the phases of the moon are about. It gives us the time to construct the changes that are necessary to meet with the next obstacle and the next challenge that lies in our path. So that's the story. Wow. I just, I'm sitting here feeling so honored and blessed to have had this conversation today. What what a gift you are. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for providing this forum because I feel that the NARM community has offered me so much, right? To be able to have words and languaging and non-words, right? To be able mm-hmm. to have the kind of somatic knowledge so that I can bring it back to my own community in the law school. And so, as I said, my wife is a therapist. And so I will routinely say, I am not a therapist. And she says, I hate to tell you, but I think you're one of us now, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so thanks to NARM and the other modalities that I've been trained in, I feel like I have two separate communities that help me talk to each other. And so thank mm. you. Yeah. Well, and before we go, do you want to tell listeners where they can find your books or (laughs) other places they can connect with you? Yes. I have a a website, marjorieflorestal.com. So that's easy enough. You can find my first novel on Amazon. It was published by Amazon's Kindle Press after winning a contest. So that's always amazing. And it's called When Death comes for you. So you should be able to remember that if nothing else. And I'm working on my second novel, which is about a Haitian American lawyer who must help a client who claims to be a descendant of Christopher Columbus and a Taino warrior princess named Yaguana from the moment of Columbus's arrival into the new world, which Maybe your listeners don't know, but Columbus's arrival and the first European fort ever built in the so-called New World was built on Haitian soil. So there is my link back to Haiti. And so that novel should be coming out hopefully by next year. So I hope you'll all stay tuned for that. Yes. Well, again, this has just been my honor and my pleasure to spend time with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been fun. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest, check the show notes or visit us at www.narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. The NARM Training Institute also offers the Inner Circle, an online self-paced learning program intended for anyone who is interested in joining an international online community focused on healing complex trauma. Each month, the Inner Circle NARM faculty guides you through a step-by-step process of learning how to integrate trauma-informed, NARM-inspired perspective into your work. In addition to these monthly NARM demonstrations, faculty host monthly topic webinars. These webinars deconstruct various elements of complex trauma from a NARM perspective. Whether you're already familiar with NARM or just learning about it, there's a place for you within the NARM Inner Circle community. Go to narmtraining.com slash inner circle to sign up and for more information. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community and connection with you and changing the world by transforming trauma.